Hi, hello and welcome to Learn Stroke IS classes by Arjun and you're listening to the editorial analysis for 2024 examination, the IS current affairs. So uh, uh, let's quickly move on to the important uh, current affairs that we have to discuss today. So obviously, uh, you will be knowing about the first important thing that we have to discuss here is a tight rope walk. So this one comes in the wake of definitely when you see this, you know, this is GS paper three. Economy is something that you have to remember. So this article completely talks about three important concepts. What is the monetary policy committee? And uh, you should be knowing about inflation. What is the concept of inflation? And what is RBI? What is the RBI going to take an important decision in regarding this? So what do you mean by MPC? And what is how... how uh, interest rate because by not raising interest rate what is rbi going to do in this regard is something that we have to know here so let's quickly jump into the article apply the ias filter inside this and quickly know the important points that we have to be uh, very clearly identified because first is what do you mean by rbi's monetary policy committee which is the mpc so something that we have to always remember is regarding the mpc so what in what in this regard as the MPC is because recently the RBI has kept the interest rates unchanged. So you can clearly see that uh, the interest rate is unchanged. And what is MPC? You can clearly see the MPC is responsible for setting key policy rates and making decisions relating to monetary policy. So I hope you know what is the difference between a monetary policy and what is the difference between a fiscal policy you will be definitely knowing the difference between all this. So first of all, get some basics right. What is the Monetary Policy Committee? You can see that it is. it was constituted by the central government led by the governor of RBI. And previously, you know, the main decisions relating to the interest rate. And you, you sh the thing that you should remember here is whenever there is an inflation happening, you know, what does RBI do? We have a lot of ratios like river, repo rate, reverse repo, CRR, SLR. So what do you think is the RBI going to do? So all these decisions were actually taken by the RBI and the governor alone. So later after some time, you see that the Monetary Policy Committee was constituted under the Reserve Bank of India Act 1934 as an initiative. So when you look at MPC, it was created for more transparency and accountability in fixing the monetary policy of India. So recently... The RBI has decided that it will keep the rates unchanged. So RBI definitely takes such important decisions every now and then. So, uh, and the inflation concerns in the article. So definitely, I hope you know what you mean by inflation and what are the important factors that causes inflation. So the article clearly say, the editorial said that the rising inflation is a big time concern because, you know, in the recent times, you see that the, the inflation was basically relatively very low. The inflation was basically very low in the first quarter, but it is accelerated significantly so that you can see that inflation is now accelerated significantly. And uh, is inflation good? Some amount of inflation is really good in certain regards. So next is regarding the uh, liquidity management. The uh, editorial also mentions about the RBI's willingness to use the OMO. These questions are often asked in the prelims examination also. What do you mean by the concept of open market operations or what do you mean by OMO? So simply understand OMOs are basically used to manage liquidity. The word is manage liquidity in the financial system. So what does OMO involve? It inv basically involves buying and selling of government securities to influence the money supply. So please do remember what is the concept of OMO, which is the open market operations. Uh, it is basically to manage liquidity. So buying and selling of government securities is one way of managing uh, liquidity by the RBI. So remember about the talks about open market operations and RBI's decision not to raise interest rates further reflects, you know, concern. What are some of the important concerns in the economy? One is a fragile economic growth plus weak imports import weak exports the exports are getting weak uneven monsoon so it all poses an important risk to the india's gdp so a very uh, uneven economic growth weak exports uneven monsoons are all creating problem uh, on top of inflation so these are some of the important issues which the article talks about uh, the indian economy as such 
So please do, uh, I hope you got an idea regarding, this is the briefest summary that you can get on this article. And uh, it also talks about exchange rate and uh, external vulnerabilities. So external vulnerabilities means uh, what is happening outside the Indian economy. Definitely something that is happening outside the Indian economy also has an impact on the economy. So RBI needs to consider exchange rates impact on inflation and external sector vulnerabilities are weakening rupee because it it need it also need to do when you look at india it also need to look at the large the larger world or the world economics in the sense you need to know you need to clearly check about the weakening rupee it can also have an impact on the exchange rate so uh, in summary what we have to do is uh, it discusses rbi's monetary policy committee and whether to uh, the biggest challenge that you can see uh, in Indian, India, in India, when RBI is given is or option, as you can see, is to you need to get a fine balance between managing inflation and supporting infl in economic growth. So if you should actually manage inflation at one side versus economic growth. You should also do not make so many controls to control inflation, but uh, you should also maintain inflation, control inflation at the same time. You should have economic growth in the Indian economy. So all these and also keep in mind the exchange rates and global economic conditions are also uh, impacting the Indian economy. So these are the important concepts that we have to understand. So uh, that was the first important editorial. And the second important editorials deals with a census for a new deal. This talks about, uh, uh, this is a, a bit political, but still I have got some important articles that you can definitely use. So this brings us, this is very useful for GS paper 2. Uh, especially you see that so, uh, GS paper 2, the, the government approach in uh, uplifting because it talks about the concept of welfare. It talks about the concept of welfare and you can even mark it uh, from the society perspective, GS paper 1. You can even mark it from GS paper 2, welfare, GS paper 1. Uh, you can even mark it from the society perspective because uh, it basically talks about the various aspects relating to caste and uh, the caste census which has happened now has created a lot of issues. So what is our uh, stand regarding all this is something that we have to understand in this. So let's uh, quickly move on to the uh, GS paper 1, GS paper 2 perspective. So uh, let's check out the, let's apply the IS filter and uh, move on to the important article right now. So what are the cons? The article clearly talks about the persistence of caste and religion in Indian politics. This is something all of you know. Because in Indian politics, as you say, the biggest vote bank is always been caste and religion. We definitely believe that uh, you should definitely vote for people who will give you development, who will give you progress, who will give you uh, growth. In India, you should really vote for all this. When you vote, make sure that we should actually vote for all these concerns. We should vote for development. We should, prog we should vote for progress. But what happens is, unfortunately, these vote becomes vote banks. When you see that people are voting in the name of caste and voting in the name of religion, which is not very good for the Indian democracy at all. So uh, caste and religion, definitely caste and religion have played a very dominant factor in Indian politics. So the recent caste survey in Bihar is seen uh, positively by certain people, but also as negatively by different people. And it, 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 it you know, it uh, significantly say that uh, these identities are uh, something which is actually being used up for 2024 elections is something that uh, political people say. But definitely this has created a lot of controversy, the caste census to uh, still, you know, when we still talk about caste, uh, how are you going to eradicate this concept of caste? But in uh, people, the uh, the government and the other important aspects say that in, if you cannot identify the number of uh, people who are backward, if you cannot know an idea about the caste, then how can we actually uplift the number of people who are backward? So data is very important. So when you need data, data is really important to make the upliftment. And in this concept, they have also discussed the concept of Mandel 2.1. And let me remind you that this was actually 1979 when the, the Mandel Commission was appointed and it submitted the report in almost 80 and it was actually implemented by almost 1990. The Mandel Commission was appointed to find out regarding the caste the backward caste, enumerate the caste system. So Mandel Commission played a very important role for caste reservation, all these aspects. So this 
thing calls is a mandal now the caste system the caste surveying everything is going to lead to what is called as a mandal 2.0 the new version it argues that it is not a return to the old uh, caste politics of 1990s but a new form that taps into the aspirations of the precariat so this brings us a new term this uh, editorial brings us about the new terms called uh, what do you mean by a concept of precariat so what do you mean by the precariat so precariat definitely means people uh, who do not have jobs who do not have employment who do not have anything so they are uh, so in that context you can see that uh, this new concept of mandal 2.0 is going to tap the aspirations of the precariat so in this context what do you mean by the con the word precariat let's quickly understand so of the precariat a significant portion of india's population is sandwiched between the the poor and the middle class is composed of the lower obc uh, or the dalits and the muslims so these groups seeks to achieve middle class status both economically and socially so you can see that they are actually sandwiched between the poor and the middle class so we say there is a poor there is a middle class and then there is an upper class people but these people they are actually sandwiched between the poor they are neither poor nor the middle class people so now it is going to be the time definitely we need to uplift the precariat because they are the people who are the, the lower the obcs the dalits muslims etc so the coalition of the precariat is based on caste so now they are the people who need more development because uh, caste identities provide an alternative symbol capital rooted in experience and historical struggles you know why uh, uh, caste is often taken as an identity because you know there is caste is the basis of how you unify people whether it is a good thing or bad thing you can see that caste is one thing where you can actually you know unify people because they have the same culture they have the same culture and they have the same uh, historical background they have the same history so definitely caste is often used to unify the people and uh, definitely in this regard remember the precariat the sections called precariat that is being mentioned here and uh, comparisons to the new deal so this editorial clearly compares and you know create a parallel between india's caste politics in india there is definitely politics of caste religion it has actually been compared to franklin roosevelt's american president the former american president franklin roosevelt's new deal in the united states which suggested that ethnic and class politics can complement each other so in the american context it was ethnic ethnic and class it was the ethnic and class because in america we don't have like the upper caste lower caste you have different ethnicities like you have the chinese you have the japanese american chinese americans or the mexican americans you have different eth different people from different backgrounds and different class in india we have caste system the religious system so uh, the article clearly brings in the franklin roosevelt's concept called new deal very important so the new nature of caste politics caste politics is evolving with political elites embracing broader obc platforms lower obc is potentially reconsidering their political affiliation so apart from the upper class the upper class and the lower class and you can say the middle class and even the caste system we say the the uh, elitist class and the people from sc uh, you can say people from sc sts and even obc now actually they are finding the politics of all this and a larger base of obc because they are large in number so obc is definitely going to have political affiliation and this will create more uh, this will become more political because it is easy for the politicians to get votes on the basis so caste politics is something that the whole article discusses about so uh, i think i'll give you a uh, important questions from this what is the significance of broad consensus among various political parties in india supporting the caste census and how does this reflect the continued importance of caste based mobilization of indian politics so it's a question what is the significance of broad consensus among various political parties in india supporting the caste census how does this reflect the continued importance of caste mobilization so this is the question relating to this so this was the general article on caste system now the next two important editorials will be relating to gs paper 2 international relations you know why i'm very clear because this talks about uh, uh, the israel palestine issue this talks about the israel palestine issue 
and most importantly it talks about hamas the important group which has unleashed a lot of violence recently so uh, let's talk about what is tufan al aqsa an important movement you can see tufan al the hamas operation because uh, it is the reason the hamas oper operation tufan al aqsa and how is the world responding to this let's quickly find out apply the ias filter and uh, let's import find out the important aspects relating to that so get a basic idea as a concept builder i'm giving you what is hamas so it is a palestinian islamist militant group which rules the gaza region so whenever you talk about uh, israel palestine issue the first thing that you have to remember is regarding the gaza the the region called gaza so palestine so in this regard uh, always understand hamas is a palestinian islamist militant group which is actually sworn to israel's destruction they only want israel's destruction to happen and has fought several wars with israel since they took power of gaza in 2007 so these people took power in gaza so gaza was occupied they took the control uh, in palestine they took control and they want to destroy israel so this is the hamas and this editorial is actually uh, comparing the al aqsa the recent operation by you can just see the recent operation tufan al aqsa uh, let's quickly tufan al aqsa you can actually compare it with the uh, recent battle called uh, in history we actually compare this thing it's called the, the yom kippur what do you mean by this it's it's the yom kippur or the yom kippur so it was actually a war so this tufan al aqsa is been compared to the yom kippur war because you should know it was the war or the october war or the ramadan war you call it by any name these were the important things uh, that was fought between israel on one side and egypt and syria on the other side from uh, 1973 so it is also called the fourth arab israeli war Uh, after three wars in 1949 56 67 and in 73 so yom kippur is actually a israel on one side and on the other side you have egypt and syria so why is it being compared because you have similar uh, similarities between the wars so this is regarding the important thing and next is parallel it draws a parallel between the recent hamas operation and the yom kippur war from 50 years ago highlighting the potential for significant regional shift so what does what what else does the article say and it talks about israel's military advantage and the assessment of israel's military advantage is conflict with hamas and uh, the reason you know definitely uh, israel is a much more mighty power israel has definitely a big it's much more a bigger power and in this regard you can clearly see that uh, uh, if actually israel is actually getting into the war it will definitely revalue the israel's strategic doctrines so it will definitely change the way israel israel should change the doctrine of uh, israel's uh, uh, strategy so that is one important thing that stays and uh, what is the impact of non state arab militias the non state arab militias so these conflicts that the hamas is actually doing will actually boost the stand, standing of non state arab militias so they are not sponsored by the state they are they are not part of the state they are the non state militias mean just like hamas islamic jihad and hezbollah and the other groups this will actually the uh, pre present uh, fightings will actually boost their confidence and morale so uh, remember hamas islamic jihad hezbollah there are other groups which can actually boost their morale so this is something that they are discussing here and uh, next is geographical limitation it mentions that the conflict is you know likely to remain geographically confined uh, with limited support from hamas from neighboring arab nations especially egypt so like the previous time uh, uh, it's likely to remain geographically confined because uh, you only limited support has been given by egypt so whenever you have hamas at this side and uh, you have israel at this side there are other people in this side egypt definitely the the arab the arab people egypt uh, syria or uh, say saudi arabia anybody who are actually nearby or the near people so this time is likely to remain is likely to remain uh, uh, 
geographically confined means they are not hamas is not getting the support from the other islamic people syria egypt so they are not getting that much support at this point of time and the regional dynamics are largely unsupportive of hamas with many arab nations disapproving the group so as i just said many arab nations are not in good support with the hamas so this can be a regional dynamics and what is the consequence for israel the present crisis presents israel's government with a challenging choice because you know it is getting a delaying rapprochement that means the rapprochement simply simply here means south israel is was going to have a good time relationship between saudi arabia so uh, they wanted to resume they wanted to resume the dialogue and resume the important discussions with saudi arabia but what happened is this is actually slowed down with the israel hamas battle this has actually slowed down so these are the important aspects of this war and what is the impact on india india will india will have an indirect impact you know how like uh, oil prices will rise and diaspora concerns especially people who are living in israel indian people who are living in israel and even the economic corridor projects because there are a lot of economic corridor projects have been planned they can actually be a slow down and uh, it could also definitely it could also have india as a safe investment destination when there is a, a con- difficulty problem happening in all these regions definitely india can actually benefit as a safe investment destination but oil price diaspora concerns economic corridor projects will all be affected with this so let's quickly um, discuss the uh, important questions if you have uh, let's check the important questions that we have uh, how does the recent hamas operation tufan al aqsa draw parallels with yom kippur war and what potential regional shifts are highlighted and what are the key takeaways regarding israel's military advantage regional dynamics and potential consequences for india in the context of hamas and israel so from india these these are the two important questions that we have generated at this time so find out all the answers and try to answer this move on to the other important editorial is again relating to israel gaza war so this is again gs paper 2 international relationship uh, so no a uh, much more larger perspective of uh, thousands of people are dead thousands are displaced so what is the statistics so get few statistics immediately apply the is filter and let's see what is something that we have to remember here so you can see that hamas incursion and casualties so both the parties in this case whether you say israel or you say palestine so you can see both of them are equally affected with all of this so hamas has launched an unexpected wide ranging attack on israel so more than 600 people have died both have lost including soldiers and civilians and uh, a lot of people took were taken captives including women children and the elderly and the number of palestinian deaths far exceeds israeli this is an important statistics so the people who die the palestinian people israel is a very tough force so the number of palestinian people who die are more than the israelis who die every year so very very important this important point has to be noted and what about israeli response and evacuation so the military deployed tens of thousands of soldiers around gaza and began evacuating israelis living in the territories border so the israeli people are taking back the uh, uh, israeli people from gaza border and uh, Gaza is a densely populated enclave so very densely uh, densely populated enclave uh, has been under israeli blockade since 2007 it's actually under blockade so uh, know about this and uh, even know about the uh, what is the unrws response so this brings us what is the united nations agency for palestinian refugees so unrwa is important in this regard uh, united nations agency so no such un agencies also which reported that over 20000 people were seeking shelter in schools in gaza so a lot of uh, refugees actually the number of displaced individuals is increasing so background tension so the conflict is occurring among heightened tensions in the region including settlement in the construction of west bank so what is the west bank and uh, there is another important jerusalem's al aqsa mosque so conflict is occurring in all the region including the settlement is increasing the construction is increasing in the west bank and uh, displacing palestine and so what is this west bank also so get a small idea regarding this it's important that you have the, what is the west bank so it's a, it's a chunk of land east of israel 
you can see west bank is actually on the east of israel and it's home to nearly 3 million it's actually home to 3 million palestinians and would make up the heart of any palestinian state so israel took control of uh, the uh, west bank in 1967 and has allowed jewish settlers to move in but palestine in most of the international community consider it illegally occupied palestinian land so know about what what is the west bank because many of the times the construction happening in west bank has created a lot of controversies so uh, this is regarding the displacement and uh, next is moving on very quick, quickly to uh, the railway debate because what is the rail gauge so gs paper 3 you can actually mark it here gs paper 3 infrastructure you can have a special section on uh, railways itself and it clearly talks about you must have heard about meter gauge the meter gauge the broad gauge and even the narrow gauge and now the most important everybody is talking about the standard gauge so it actually did you must have seen the old track system like this in british times we had the meter gauge so what are the uh, important aspects regarding that and now everybody is suddenly talking about standard gauge because many of the metros the metros have popularized internationally popularized the standard gauge but uh, this editorial actually focuses that uh, broad gauge is much more better than the standard gauge so what are these important aspects let's quickly find out let's apply the is filter and uh, let's find out the important answer right away so let me give you a brief idea it's a debate going on over the railway gauges that means i hope you got the idea it's actually the track the size of the tracks the size and the length of the tracks and uh, majority of the railway tracks in india uses the bg certain rapid rail and metro systems are built on the standard gauge so always understand broad gauge meter gauge narrow gauge indicate the width between the two tracks like this it is the width between some have larger widths and some have very close width if you have seen the uh, uh, important uh, mountain railways you will see that you must have seen you can see the narrow and the meter gauge so broad gauge is 1.676 meters narrow gauge is 0.762 meters and meter gauge was exactly one meter so now we are actually saying that broad gauge is much more better is what the editorial actually says what 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 is your opinion on that let's quickly find out historical background the gauge date back to 1870s when the meter gauge was introduced in india so a lot of times so you can see it was one meter gauge that was used in 1990s a uni gauge policy was launched to convert most of the meter gauges were slowly getting converted to bg broad gauges so after 1990s you can see that the, the small things actually got widened and uh, most of the things were converted to bg but however standard gauge is getting more traction particularly with the influence of sridhar and the former md of delhi metro it's getting more uh, important so advantages of standard gauge so they argue that standard gauge is more important because it is a universal gauge many metro systems around the world use this so they say that it requires less space and benefit from advanced technology for coach design so better better coach designing you can have better coach design it will require less space and it will have more benefits apart from the broad gauge so this is what standard gauge everybody wants to know have the standard gauge what are the counter arguments let's see the counter arguments both bg and sg have similar space requirements on roads and aerial structure so whether you actually uh, on put it on the road or when it when it goes on the aerial structures when it through the, either what happens is more of them they have a very similar space requirements but bg can be more cost efficient due to the higher capacity so bg definitely can be more cost efficient due to the higher capacity and some misconception which people say about uh, bg is that uh, it it includes higher turning radius it has a higher turning radius which reduces speed and you know throughput and uh, it, it reduces the speed due to the higher turning radius and uh, they say that the uh, uh, the throughput is basically same similar for both broad gauge and uh, you know standard gauges and even rolling stock can be easily replaced so standard gauge when you talk about bg bg is definitely having certain uh, advantages is what the editorial says and the importance of integration so uh, integrating new rail system with the existing bg network in india the integration would benefit passengers 
cargo movement and improve patronage and be useful in emergency so definitely uh new rail system should also be integrated with the existing bg network and not the standard gauge because bg will definitely help benefit the passengers cargo movement etc and uh, it, it is actually asking the government to reevaluate the gauge debate and consider building all future rail system in bg that is a key word consider making all future rail system with the bg for compatibility and seamless connectivity so bg broad gauge is definitely the best thing according to the article so what is your uh, thought on that let's find out and uh, let's take uh, important question also this point what are the key arguments in favor of standard gauge for railway systems and how do they compare to the benefits of broad gauge in the indian context important why is the integration of new rail systems with existing ex extensive broad gauge network considered crucial and how can it benefit passengers and cargo movement in india so two important questions so find out the answers to this prepare for this maybe you can expect it for the next mains examination so that was the important important contents that we have discussed for uh, uh, from today's editorial and uh, so do subscribe to our channel check out the telegram channel and read the insta channel for any inquiries always mail us call us in the number so do subscribe the channels and let's come up with another important editorial summary very soon